What are you guys doing here watching me work? Can't you see that I'm busy? Go watch the episode. They're coming to get you, Barbara. This time on Graveyard Cars. Cousin Dougie begins the resurrection of the one of 48 426 Hemi Automatic 1971 Phoenix Cuda. I think we can restore this car. I'm very optimistic about this one. George is eager to begin cutting metal on Tony D'Agostino's 1970 Challenger. But first, he needs permission from Mark. Tony is what we refer to in the business as a lunatic. Finally, Will and Alyssa dust off in detail the 392 Hemi 1971 SEMA CUDA in preparation for the 2018 Cruise at the Creek Car Show. Alyssa and I, we're one. We're like peanut butter and jelly. We're not going to have any issues. You're a joke. In Springfield, Oregon, Mark Warman, together with his skilled ghouls, it has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. Bring classic Mopar muscle cars back from the dead to look like they did the moment they left the factory floor. Because of the obvious threat, this station will remain on the air day and night. All right, I'm gonna go grab Mark, get him out here. He's got detailed instructions on what he wants done before you start cutting anything. Why, I've cut like 50 of them apart. Because this is Tony's car. I've got like done. 50 of them, come on now. Yeah but, the, yeah, but this is still Tony's car, so do not touch until Mark gets out here. Okay. Another beautiful day in Oregon. This is gonna be a fun week. So one of the first things I have to do is work with George on uh, Tony D'Agostino's 1970 Dodge Challenger. We're ready to do the metal work on it, but since Tony's a freak, he wants the smallest patch as possible. Another car I'm looking forward to this week is our Phoenix Cuda that was caught in the fire and almost killed the guy that owns it. It's ready to have its disassembly. So I want to work with Doug on a few key things. He knows the protocol, but I want to spend time with him showing him the mystery of why some areas of the car are burned to crisp and other areas still have paint on them that's beautiful. This weekend coming up, we've got a really fun event up in Washington. Every year, Little Creek Casino invites us up. The car that we're gonna be taking this year is our 1971 Cuda 392 Hemi. I've gotta pull that into the shop, round up Will and Alyssa, and have them detail the car. One of the things I get to do up there, by the way, is judge the cars, that's always fun for me. Now, Will and Alyssa, their job up there is to get drunk. I mean, really. I think the competition would be to see who cuckoos themselves first and who passes out. Let the games begin. <laughs> I ain't never gonna die. Before you go, go, don't leave me hanging on like a yo-yo. That's not how the song goes, That's Mark. That's how the song goes exactly. Let's also listen to another one. Little Willy Willy won't go home. I'll go home when you get this done. Curious George. I told him to wait for you. This is Tony D'Agostino's car, and Tony is what we refer to in the business as a lunatic. So, while I admit he knows more than most people will ever know more about than you. these cars. He doesn't know more than me. Okay. Doesn't know more than me. Okay, you know, I'm not even doing it. Yeah, he don't does. do it. He, he, no, he's a very knowledgeable Mopar guy. He's smarter guy. than There's me no, when it comes to Mopar. He's and not smarter okay. than me when it comes to that's Mopar. Fine. Well, we've had two contests and I've won them both, so. Tony D'Agostino would like to inform you that Mark the Iceman Warman is incorrect. There was in fact only one official Mopar knowledge contest, and it was not won by Mark Cool Runs Warman. In point of fact, the contest was won by Stan the Man Lynch in what Tony calls, quote, a freak incident of dumb, 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 stupid luck. It was a series of unfortunate technicalities that involved an Italian sports car and a ketchup sandwich. P.S. I don't eat that many Philly cheesesteaks. End quote. We now return you to the feature presentation. Wow. 
The name of the game is we want to keep as much original sheet metal on the car as humanly possible. It's a survivor body type car, meaning there's no rust. It's a, it was a California peach, man. It was just a beautiful car. So when I'm talking about a California car, most of the time, what I'm referring to is the fact that it was born and raised in California. And so what that means in the car community is that's a fairly dry state. So there's a very good chance when I'm saying I got a 70 Cuda, it's a California car, it means that the body is in mint condition, that there's no rust like Tony D'Agostino's 1970 Challenger. It spent its entire life in Southern California, so it's very minimal rust. So where we normally would just start putting full panels on because it's faster and it doesn't matter because the rest of the car is a pile of poo poo, this one's a really nice car. So I promised Tony that I would be involved in whatever panels get replaced, okay? So we okay. just have that mentality. Is that funny when people fall and get hurt? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay, I remember that. You jelly belly. I didn't say anything about you looking like one of those Mike and Ikes walking around out there with big old pooches sticking out past your waistline. What are you laughing about here? <laughs> While this side is up in the air, George, you have a couple of pinholes here. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to make drill those out until you know you got good metal, and then I want you to weld them up. And I want no big bird weld all over the place. I want a nice weld on those, and I want to file down. Okay. okay. I'll order the quarter patch for this, but we'll stay below this style line, even though the patch goes above it. We'll stay below it. Maybe even right on it, or just an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch below it. So right through there. So we'll dissect this off. That's going to leave us the trunk floor extension, which is also full of holes. So we're going to replace it. One piece trunk floor from AMD. We're going to put it in as one piece. We're going to replace both trunk floor extensions. This side is really nice. The way we're going to get a one piece trunk floor in there is we're going to sacrifice the Dutchman panel. Reason being, it's rotten up in here. So you drill the spot wells out, sacrificing the Dutchman, leaving the quarter really nice. So when I go back in there and I see where you pinched it together and spot welded it, the quarter part, the flange, it's nice. It never got hurt, remember? You're sacrificing that part to do it. Then save this part because we want to be able to mark all the holes for the vinyl top. Okay, no problem. On the floor itself, we've got a little bit of Swiss cheese going on here, okay? So if I hold the light, you can see it real well. So when it comes to the panel on the floor, I look at the fact that it's just got, I mean, there's a lot of little ones, but it's more like little pepper holes, right? So we can weld those up. We can take a brass uh, plate that goes on the back side of it so the stick doesn't just fly through when we go to weld it. Weld up those holes, grind them down, and you've got an original panel that's just been touched up. Sometimes old, thin metal will burn back when you're trying to weld it. If that were to happen, at that point, George would come to me and say, listen, we're spinning our wheels, let's put a patch in there. Now, George also knows that uh, Tony D'Agostino is... Uh, calorically challenged on days, and uh, he, he might have a bit of a heavy foot, not just from the standpoint of stepping on the gas, but you know, he eats a lot of Philly steaks. That's not my fault. I didn't tell him to, okay? He's a fat <laughs> all right? Is that what you wanna hear? You know, and, and I love Tony, but you know, he is a bigger guy. He's a, he's a larger fellow, uh, you know, like uh, James Gummer, you know? <laughs> Point being that if he sits in the car, he's a heavy fella. I don't want him putting his foot through the floor like Fred Flintstone and bringing back a couple of bloody nubs. The rest of it is good solid steel, okay? Okay, no problem. The other problem, and I don't know why or how it happened, but this right here, this is probably factory. See the way those two meet? Yeah. I don't see any evidence of damage on the car. It was probably Friday and they wanted to get out of there and it didn't fit very well, so the guy just smashed it right here with a hammer. I just want to dolly and hammer and bring that up to here a little bit closer. It doesn't have to be perfect because we're gonna seam seal it. Okay. Okay. Underneath the hood, piece of cake. You've got your areas here. So AMD makes a pre-broke piece for in here and for the other side. These, we'll just make our own patches. I don't want, I want to keep the patches as small as possible and I also want to document them. So when you have the piece cut out, I want a picture and when you have the piece put in. I want the piece put in like a picture window. Okay, so you can metal finish it off and we won't have any filler around it. Okay, if you like your eyebrows. When all, yeah, he's looking pretty, I don't know, he's very animated. He reminds me of that Chucky doll. Well, yeah. I'm, just try I'm yeah. trying to focus, guys. You know, you're come just, on. This is a big car. You guys. Well, the howdy doody. Car. That's what it is. Howdy doody with the strings, right? And he's got that crazy face. 
Listen, you, you should be, yeah, you should be wearing a plaid shirt and stuff. All right. That apron right there. I want to be the guy to fix that. Okay. I don't want you to do anything with it. I want to be the guy to metal finish that off. All right, it's just a little wrinkled up there and it needs to be fixed right. This car was popped in the right front corner at some time. That's it. Other than that, you guys are ready to go. You can start prepping out the floors after he's done, getting them seam sealed, doing the thing. Yeah. So. Meeting as you earned. This 1971 Dodge Charger RT is our corpse of the week. Now the 71 Charger was the first of the third generation Chargers. Some people love them, some people hate them. I personally think they're pretty cool. You could get a 440 Magnum, that was standard. You could order a 446 pack or a 426 Hemi. Now for me, I would love to see this car in top banana yellow with a black top, a black stripe, a 440 Magnum, and a four-speed transmission. Just for the record, on this beautiful little car dressed out like that, they made 332 of those. So if you're lucky enough to have one of those, you definitely have a Corpse of the Week. Tomorrow we're heading up to Little Creek Casino for a car show. We do autographs and signings. Uh, we make a whole weekend out of it. It's really nice. This year we are taking the SEMA CUDA. It'll be kind of on display in the middle of everything. So before we head up there, I have to get the car detailed. While the paint still looks great for being two years old, uh, just kind of freshening it up. We just want to make it look as good as it can so that way it represents this company well. So I've already wiped the car down so the surface is already clean. Um, I'll go through and mask up the door jams. Anywhere a compound can get, I'll just mask that area off. I'll go through, do a, just a nice clean polish on it. After that's done, I'll wipe all that down, blow it all off, give it a nice wax job on it. And while that wax is drying, I'll have a list of jump on the interior, just freshening the car up. Hey, look who decided to show up today. Hey, good morning. Maybe morning for you. Let's start a little bit sooner. I'm sure that he's probably going to give me the crappiest job there is on this car, so I'm prepared for it. Is your watch break? No. Oh. OK, so what are we doing? This is what I would like would be <laughs> for you to get the vacuum, vacuum out the inside, and then <laughs> clean the glass. My job is to vacuum the car and to wash the windows. And that's really not that bad. I thought he was going to hand me a toothbrush and have me clean the underside of it. So far, so good. OK. Plug-ins over here. Why, why are you just standing there? Waiting for you. We have about two hours left to get the car wrapped up. Then we're going to get it over to Dougie to get it loaded up and get it out. It's pretty easy to vacuum brand new carpet. Alyssa and I get along good enough for pictures. So when you look at the pictures, it's like, oh, what a great time you guys had. But in reality, it doesn't always go that well. Here's the thing, I don't want to get you riled up because you're all cracked out of energy drinks and you get ghetto really quick. Oh so, my God. No, but that's, no, I, I just. You know, Will likes to say that I get drunk a lot there just because he's insecure with the fact that he knows he gets drunk there and my dad sees him. Drink, I'll drink, I'll say it. I don't know, I don't, I'm, I'm, I probably won't. Oh, I'm sure you aren't. Will. You won't catch Will at Little Creek without a drink in his hand. The only thing you're going to see in my hand is a cup of water. That's it. Can't speak for her, but that's all you get out of me. The car came out great. I didn't have a ton for Alyssa to do because she showed up late, so I kind of had to do most of it. But the paint looks good, the inside looks good. We're ready to hit Little Creek. She's ready to get drunk. It's gonna be a good time. Okay, so the next step for this car is we're gonna put it in the trailer, and then we're gonna hook it up to the rollback, and Doug is gonna tow it up to Little Creek. One of the biggest challenges to ever come to Graveyard Cars is the 71 Hemi Cuda that burned in the fire, Wendell's car. The owner of the car, we had him on, I think it was last season, was talking about how he survived that fire. It took a while to get over the, uh, the distress of what happened. And actually, I let it set for years. I didn't even look at it. And 
when I get the car back and it's finished, that will put the end to all of this that I've been through. And losing the car and the structure explosion and all the trauma that went with it, it's gone. It is one of 48 1971 426 Hemi automatic Cudas made. That's pretty low. But you also have the fact that he survived a fire. And in some ways, he says he's here today because of the Cuda, because it helped save his life. So it's been here for a few months now. It finally made its way through the queue so we can get to a point to disassemble it. I'm coming out to catch up with Doug. I just want to look underneath it, notice some of the things I told Wendell that I would look at it and give another opinion once I have it up in the air. Uh, so that's what I'm doing out here right now. Doug's getting ready to drop a suspension and drivetrain out of it and disassemble the car. I'm just going to catch up with him. Did you notice that the bottom of the trunk, the blue, between the tank and that is just beautiful. And the fuel lines, look at the fuel lines. They're not damaged at all. They're, they're actually still supple even. Uh-huh. And these are the original KV lines, by the way. You know, it's just amazing to me. Here's this beautiful paint up underneath the, the fuel tank. Now think about that. A fuel tank is a bomb. I mean, when it comes to fire, it's got gas in it. That's what caused the fire in the first place. Why didn't the tank explode, right? But it's a miracle, and I think Wendell's right about that. It's a true miracle, the way things happened, that, that he didn't get hurt a whole lot worse. Yeah, I was lucky. I was on the floor face down, and I crawled out of the, I crawled out the door that had blown off the building. When I look at a car like this, and I see the rubber hoses for the fuel line still in good shape, I know there was a touch of miracle going on in this car. So I'm getting optimistic about the restorability of the car, even more so than I was. So you look at the leaf spring, and you can tell definitely the leaf spring got super hot. It got so hot that it melted one of the liners out of it, right? All the way back here at the back. Yeah. But it didn't even affect that. It's just a weird thing, because you know why? I think if that tank had got hot enough to melt those, this thing wouldn't be here right now. Right. In 1971, the Dodge Charger came standard with a 440 Magnum. Could have got an automatic transmission or a four-speed behind that. If you had ordered one with the four-speed, how many of them were built? What's the total number? Is it 332, 432, or 532? If you stay tuned after the break, I'll give you the answer. my ghoulish friends, how did you do on that one? How many did you say 1971 Charger RTs with a 440 Magnum and a four-speed were built? If you guessed 332, you guessed right. That's exactly right. It also means you were watching our Corpse of the Week at the beginning of the episode. Now, you could have also, with your 1971 Dodge Charger RT, gotten, ordered, paid extra for a 446 pack and a 426 Hemi. Should you have optioned a 426 Hemi with a four-speed behind it, they made 30 of those. So if you have one of those, you're pretty cool. You guys keep the camera on me while I walk off like I said something really important. And don't add the part about I said something really important. I'm working with Doug on going over the 1971 Hemi Cuda, the Phoenix Cuda, the one that uh, burned to the ground, and we're gonna bring back to life like a Phoenix rising out of the ashes. To me, that's amazing. As you work your way forward, you can tell the exhaust has definitely gotten hot. It's got that look like it's been hot and then cooled back down again. All this stuff is rusty through here. But even look at the undercoating. So this is a factory undercoating part, right? Look at this. how nice that metal is up underneath there. And solid. Wow. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. That's what I think when it comes back, it's gonna be in really nice shape. Again, why didn't the undercoating burn off of these things? Why didn't it melt and blow up? Wasn't meant to be. You know, I, I grew up with Doug, so I know, I know how his brain computes things to a certain degree. He's a, he's a thinker, he's a deep thinker, but not always do you realize that when the, you get that glazed over look as he's staring at you, that he's actually thinking. I think there are times where he just kind of, the circuit breaks, you know? You ever blown a fuse in a house, everything goes dark? I think there's times where that's what's happening with him. But soon somebody kicks the breaker back on and, and he's got his answer for you. 
One of the craziest things is the torsion bar. You saw that already? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Here's this heat so hot on a torsion bar, and if anybody's ever held a torsion bar in their hand, they know it's solid steel, right? It got so hot that while under a load, the heat caused it to just shear, literally shear in half. I mean, that's an interesting anomaly when you go to the back and you got a fuel tank with all the fuel lines still in place and the fact that the tank didn't explode. It's crazy. It is. I think we can restore this car. I'm very optimistic about this one. I've been working on this a little bit last night and uh, most of the fasteners are coming off very easily. But you'd think they'd just be fried into place. Uh-huh, yeah. Huh. Just absolutely crazy. But the rest of it, like I say, this, this looks better than 99% of the cars that are rusty out back. So while it does, Pictures worth a thousand words at the same time. You can't judge the book by its cover. Take a look at this. This was cool. Talking about heat. These things tear. Brand new ones tear uh -huh. if we install them. Yeah. If you don't hold your tongue just right, they rip. All right. But yet, these haven't even melted. The grease isn't burned off. But hot enough here to break a torsion. It's bar. just the weirdest thing I've seen. Even look up in here. You can still see the remnants of the plastic. That's all the things that would melt did melt right there. But yet under here, just a foot away, nothing. So really it's at a point now where I can cut Doug loose to go ahead and finish disassembling it. We're gonna record some of the things that are coming off at some of the more important things so that you can see how they came out and what condition the raw organic appearance of them is, so. We're talking about bringing a car back to life with an owner who is emotionally really attached to the car. And we've had a few of them like that. This car will mean something to Wendell for the rest of his life. One of the first things we have to do is get it raised up in the air, get all the fluids out of it. Once the fluids are out, we can begin the disassembly and inventorying of the car. After that, he will lower it back down on the ground, roll it forward. That's when he can pull all the things off like the fenders, doors, hood, deck lid, tail lights, grill, lower balance bumpers, anything left on that car to keep it from just being a shell on the outside, he can do right there. And he can drop the rear end out of it, the front suspension, take all the fuel lines, brake lines, the rest of the pieces that bolt onto the unibody, he can get them out of there. When he's done, he'll have an empty shell, albeit a, a burned up empty shell, that we can send off to the metal dipper, have the body cleaned, then we can reassess exactly what we're gonna have to replace. It's summertime, 1975, you're 18 years old. You're gonna cruise the gut, gonna go dragging with your buddies. Which one of these cars do you wanna be seen in? The 1972 Challenger Rally, 340 Magnum, four speed. They made 357 of them. Or the 1971 Dodge Charger RT, 440 Magnum automatic. They made 2,172 of those, just for the record. This car is a factory gold car. This is street base and blue. Go to graveyardcars.com and cast your vote for which one you would want to be seen driving, and we will reveal the answer live next week on Facebook. So far, Mark gave George the green light to begin metalwork on Tony D'Agostino's 1970 Challenger. Meeting as you earned. Cousin Dougie burned rubber, disassembling the one of 48 Hemi 1971 Phoenix Cuda. Meanwhile, Will and Alyssa detailed the 392 Hemi 1971 SEMA Cuda. I don't want to get you riled up because you're all cracked out of energy drinks and you get ghetto really quick. And now the ghouls are heading north for the 2018 Cruise at the Creek Car Show. We're up in Shelton, Washington right now at the Cruise the Creek Car Show, and it's just such a blast to come up here. We come up every year now, I think it's our third year. Uh, it's awesome because we, we started this like three years ago, and we had a lot of fans here, but each year it just doubles in size. So seeing how much love we get on the West Coast is always a good thing. You know, it's really humbling to see people coming down to meet us and not even to see yeah. the cars. Um, I'm still surprised when people walk up to our booth and say, hey, you know, we saw you guys were coming down here and we came by just to see you. Love the show, love what he's doing. So it's been fun to watch. Love been watching show. since season one. Meet me. People are all really nice, you know, they want to talk to you. Everybody here has got a story about a car that they had or that they have. People get to know you and they come out and they're really, they want to visit with you, they want to tell you about their cars, which is great, that's what I'm here for. 
So we're going to spend the day walking around, looking at the cars, judging them, interacting with people. So, yeah. I knew Alyssa and I had to pick a first and a second place paint this year. So you kind of start looking before the crowd gets too hot and heavy. So you kind of just do like a good overview before you actually get in the middle of everything. Right now, I'm going to grab Alyssa and we are going to head out to pick out what we feel is the best paint job here at Little Creek Casino. It's going to go great. I got my sidekick, my partner in crime. We're going to knock this off the park. Oh, Alyssa and I, we're, we're one. We're like peanut butter and jelly. They're not going to have any issues. It's going to go just fine. Why do you get to drive? I'm not drinking. I haven't been drinking. I see. Me? Okay. <laughs> Polaris is a blast. You know, I have so much fun in that thing. I love taking it out, but there was not a chance in hell I was going to listen to driving. Man, fine first gear. Let's go. He's yeah. never, he's only into an automatic. Yes, it started at 6 a.m. though. I wanted to make sure I had enough energy. <laughs> you started early. <laughs> I, I did. did. <laughs> I did. I'm not a morning person at all. Huh couple hours into our day, you know, she was getting a little happier, a little more spunky. So I'm sure it was just the nerves were calm finally. I don't know why. always a challenge. Woo! You know, it's constant bickering and picking on each other. You're... I'm what? You're a joke. I'm a joke. <laughs> I'm a joke. There's my NASCAR. Man, that is a pretty well, car. Look at that. They were giving us about a half hour to go pick out two cars. And like I said, we already kind of had an idea what, which ones we really liked. It literally took us an hour and a half to try to get through these cars because people are like, hey, right here, take a picture with my car, no matter what the make and model is. So her and I completely got swarmed. What time you got down here? I, he's right. driving. He's always to blame. That's the problem. Yeah. And I literally think we got, we did everything that everybody asked us to do. So I know we ran over, but I know the end result is all the fans were super happy. I think I, I need to turn to drive before we get to park this beast. I don't trust you to drive, but you can't drive stick. Okay, first of all, I'm not gonna kill anybody. Second of all, I'm not gonna ruin anything. So what's the harm? Other than maybe you might get a little scared. There's a lot of nice cars in that area. I, you know, she was really thirsty that day. I don't know with what. I just felt it was best that if I, I did all the driving. We got separated, so I kind of went slow, kind of put it away. Hey, how we are. introduced the Dodge Charger, the first generation. 1974, it said goodbye to the last of the generations, the third generation. True or false, the very first year for the third generation Dodge Charger was 1972. You stay tuned and after the break, I'll give you the answer. All right, folks, true or false, how'd you do? 1972, was it the first year for the third generation Charger? No. Now, if you were watching the Corpse of the Week, you would know that 1971 was the first year. You're gonna wanna watch those in the beginning of the episode so you can answer the question through the episode. It's called learning. So, you know, in another effort to uh, fact check or keeping them honest, I wanted to do a comparison of the B-Body consoles. I want to compare an original one that I have here with one of Tony's Mopar Parts ones over there. After 25 years of restoring cars and another 10 years of playing with them, I can tell you it is difficult to find a 66 to 70 B-Body console that hasn't had something happen to it. So. In the case of this particular console, is this classic move right here. Everybody wanted to do something trick. I have no idea what it did back in the day. It'll be fun to ask the owner, but who knows what he'll say. We're gonna start by setting them at the same angle. Right here, you see a cutout. This cutout would not exist if this was an automatic console, but because this console is for a four-speed, as this car was, then you don't see that. So take a nice close look at that. You'll see the same cutout that's here, that's right here. 
The only difference is on a four speed, this outer cardboard piece covers the side of the hump that is so wide on the four speed cars. That's what that's for. So if you look back here, you'll clearly see that there's two pan head screws that hold this trim plate on. These are the two provisions for that. They look identical. Right here, we have a hole and a recessed area. Hole and recessed area. This is for the mounting of the console. A raised area here that you can see is broken out. That's another problem with these things. They break out where you mount them. Here's a brand new hole. We have this recessed area right here. Absolutely identical and in the same area. At the front, this is the front console mounting area. You see the two holes, the raised rib with this unique styling across it. He could have done anything in there to make that reinforced and make it able to bolt into the car, but he wanted it to be identical to an original. And let's just take a really nice, close look, but I want you to see that grain. That grain is an exact same match to that grain there. One of the hardest things Tony said to get done right was to match these two grains, and it matches perfectly. As you set this up there, you see it fits. We have the console cut out right here for the carpet. We have the same console cut out right here for the carpet. Here you have your console lights that come on when you open the door. Same provision up here as you have down there. So right here, you basically have an identical console. This is what you would have ordered from Chrysler in 1970 if you busted your original one or somebody stole it or whatever happened to it. You would have got one just like this. As I got a little bit of time after we did all of our signing and things like that, I got a chance to come out and look at the cars, just kind of uh, be left alone and have fun. Now, I've been going a little crazy with the OEM stuff. Everybody knows I'm not abandoning it. I love it. I also love weird and I also love macabre. One of my favorite cars right here, 62 Pontiac Bonneville Ambulance. My name's Corey Zamzow. This is my 62 Pontiac Ambulance. I like not the normal stuff. I like to go to a car show and be the only one there with the only thing. This is so cool. So this guy drug this out of its original home here in Washington. It was a family owned business, but this car still has the original name on it. That guy's name was Al Hyden and he was a truck driver and uh, he'd get the call or whatever and his wife would come once in a while and she was a nurse. You got there as fast as you could, threw him in the back and hauled ass to wherever you needed to go. Learn to appreciate your heritage. You learn to appreciate the heritage of the car. So I look around a dashboard like this I see all the chrome. Back in the day, Pontiac was very proud of that car. So there's a lot of chrome. Well, it's kitted and it's decayed and needs work. All of it's there. The original ashtray is there. You got the original cigarette lighter. This is the dash control panel for all the stuff that you see up there, right? So I flip this switch up. And that's the siren, OK? Look inside, you'll see that there are zipper access points inside built into the headliner that actually get you into these up here so you can work on them. All that stuff was thought out ahead of time. This is, again, very, very old stuff. It's all original. If you look at the paint and the body on it, nothing's been done. This is the way it started life way, way back in the day, and it's still around. I like every kind of car. It doesn't matter what it is. I like anything, but I like weird stuff, and if somebody likes the same stuff I do, that's like cool with me. This is a treasure trove. Well, it's not a cubic dollar treasure trove. This is it. This is the best example of walking back to whatever year it was parked. These were in the car. This, this multi-trauma dressing kit was in underneath the hatch, 1967. I mean, to drag something out and to find that still inside the car from when it was serviced, this bag has the original burn dressing kits in it from when it was parked the last time. I don't expect anybody to get super stoked like I do because I love this kind of history. Everybody knows I do. And I know it's not a Mopar, so get over it. It's a neat car, and it's a neat piece of our history, just like so many of these cars. People come up to me in this show all day long saying, I'm not a Mopar guy, I'm a Ford guy, but I love your show, I love what you're doing, you're, you're trying to teach you. It sounds like we're getting the message across to appreciate these cars. And I'm, a lot of people have done it long before I ever came around. I'm just saying that we're adding our little two cents worth. That at the end of the day, I think what we're doing is helping part of our heritage stay alive and keep people passionate about it like I've been my whole life. Uh, went as good as it uh, could be expected. Beautiful cars out here, uh, tons of people, so we gotta stop, do autographs, do pictures, get pictures next to the cars. But I lost my co-pilot, so. 
he lost his <laughs> co pilot because Co-co? he. Co? He left. Co. Co. Co pilot. She's not happy right now. What happened? Okay, first of all, Will left me. I got out of the car to get pictures for people. Yeah. People asked me for pictures, yeah. and I was nice enough to stop. And then I look around, and Will's nowhere to be seen. Then we get out here, and then I have to find you, and you make me go halfway across the resort. Because you didn't play a little joke, like, oh, I'm just kidding, I'm leaving you, let me go around the corner. No. no. You go the full mile. The producer called. The Our producer called, said so you got to get back. I had to walk here. I hate you. Hate's a strong word. Don't have and hate and in your I heart. And I mean it. And I mean it. Yeah. I mean it so much. It'll buff out. Should have buff. That hate will buff out. Will it? Anyways. So, so we I picked just, a car. Yeah. Um, whatever. And we're good to go now. Did we? We picked a car? The Firebird that I picked was just a gorgeous car. It was very well done, very meticulous. It was a resto mod, so it had all the new upgrades in it. My dad's gonna give you this on a Mopar. I picked a Chevy last year. Just the little details. They got rid of the wipers completely. Now, you know, I get it, but these cars aren't driven in the rain, but it gives a sleeker look. They got rid of the uh, drip rail gutters that run along the side. Just little details like that that they got rid of that just makes the car look really clean. The paint was beautiful, top to bottom. It was just a very sanitary job on that, from start to finish on the car. Color always catches my eye, so but it's also got to fit the car. Somebody might have a paint job, but if it's on a Pinot, it just doesn't work. So I always like to find a good combination of what's classy, but yet stands out on that vehicle. Yeah, the Firebird was a, was a clear winner. Um, it, like I said, it was, a, it was done great. Alyssa agreed. Will chose a Firebird. Obviously, I obviously I had no choice in that. That was totally a Will choice. I got to meet the guy that did the car and meet the guy that owned the car. So that was kind of cool to have both guys there because the guy that restored the car had a car sitting right next to it. But it, it was cool to meet both of them. Yeah, it's a pretty car. I know I was looking at it last night from my motel room. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Yeah. I really like the banner between everyone. It's, you know, it's pretty entertaining, that part. I have a greater He's responsibility than He's you could possibly fathom. We did this you last season Santiago, in the same And you cursed thing. the Marines. We need something new. We no use words like honor. What have you done? <laughs> leave him You've alone. killed the fly. Oh, leave it alone. You told me to send the lead, though. Yeah, yeah, you want to send lead, yeah. But then Ryan told me it causes cancer when you sand it. It can cause cancer. We live in a really small town where I really don't. I mean, Will gets a little, recognized a little bit more than I do, but I never get recognized. So coming here and all of a sudden people knowing who you are, it's really, it's kind of mind blowing. And like I said, it's, it really is humbling. No, I really like Royal. I love Mark. I think he's hilarious. They kind of remind me of each other. It's been something I've been watching since 2012, since the inception of the show. And it's always uh, been so fascinating to see step by step how they go through all the process, and I, I love the way it's explained what they're doing. You know, I can't help but think uh, that we're doing a good job at, at Graveyard Cars, that we're teaching our audience, they're having some entertainment and some fun, and they're learning a lot about these cars. What they can do to a car that they pull out of the weeds, it's basically gone, and they can bring it back to new is, you know, the talent they have for doing that is, is amazing. People will come up in their Chevy, Ford, AMC guys, foreign cars, they still watch the show. They watch it because they love learning, they love the techniques that we teach them, they love when I nerd out on all the weird stuff even though it doesn't mean anything to them. Do you ever just wish sometimes you could unzip your head and just yard your brain out and put mine in there? No. And I think it's just seeing a group of people that are in their zone. I think everybody wants to see somebody specialized and good at what they do. I think that has attributed to our, our really big success. Especially now in season 10, it's unbelievable how many Mopars are here, how many people are here. It's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, yeah. we're on the grind from a day-to-day -day basis, and sometimes it can get a little monotonous for us at the shop. Because, you know, we got, we got a lot of pressure. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. But then we get out here, and we see how much everybody loves what we do yeah. and appreciates it and supports it. And it's just it's kind of a, ref a refresher for us. I, I don't even, it's really hard to think, you know, being famous, it doesn't, it doesn't compute really. Even, even still, you know, after seven years, it's, it, it's getting, you know, we get to get paid for what we love to do. It's, it's a blast. It's humbling and and it's awkward sometimes, right? There's a lot of people and they're looking for you for answers and uh, you don't get a lot of time for yourself. But at the end of the day, I enjoy what we have right now. I think that we've been blessed to have what we have to grow the way we have. And so I'm just enjoying the ride. So we're all back at the shop, ready to start working on cars again. It was a great trip. 
Uh, one of the cars that I did get a chance to check out while I was up there, and I, I noticed it won a great big trophy at the end, was this beautiful Chrysler convertible. Absolutely gorgeous. One of the funnest things about when I was growing up, when you'd see sketches or drawings of cars in the future, they always look like, you know, space age stuff. So they were trying to make cars back then have that space age look to them, like I guess what they anticipated it was going to be. So when you look at the Chrysler 300, you see the aviation style instrument panel, and that totally looks like it could be in a fighter jet. Tail lights are the same way. We'll take a good close look at those things with the, the, I don't know if they look like the exhaust of a jet or something like that, sitting on top of those big beautiful fins. The Continental kit, which is that uh, deck lid where you see the raised up hump that looks like the spare tires right underneath it. Uh, again, a lot of pride, a lot of craftsmanship. Go to the front bumper on that car, the front bumper and the grill. Absolutely a work of art. They're big, they weren't trying to save any money. Uh, look at the steering wheel, kind of an odd shape, right? It's more square than it is round. Probably contour, probably comfort. They've got a switch on the floor right next to the dimmer switch, I think it's just above it, that when you push that, it'll have the radio searching. It, it, it starts rolling all on its own as though you're turning a dial. It's actually rolling up and down the log trying to find music, and wherever it stops, you can hit the button again and go past it. So again, creature comforts. Uh, the swivel seats, uh, it's not just that they look great, but they look rich. They look, they look like they're really designed to go in a Chrysler Imperial. They pivot, which is a great thing, as I say, you know, if you're a businessman or a lady in a dress trying to get in, that's a great feature. But the fact that they're so padded, so full, so rich, everything on that car, from the front bumper to the rear bumper, just screams quality, it screams beauty, it screams luxury. They were proud of them. They weren't trying to build the cheapest cars the fastest back then. They were building the best car they could because they wanted to beat the competition. They wanted to beat Ford, they wanted to beat Cadillac. And I think when it came to that particular car, they at least gave them a run for the money. I believe that we had a very good week. I yes. got a chance to work with George, mano y mano. Yes, you guys did, didn't you? You got a lot done. We did. George, I think, has come a long way, and it's nice. Did you get along with him? George, George yeah. Everybody, man, everybody a gets along is. with Georgie. George is a lover. Like George. George is seriously such a nice guy. He's got a heart of gold. Doesn't have a mean bone in his body, does he? Dougie and I had a great opportunity to work on the 1971 CUDA 426 semi-automatic. How many made? Two. 48 disassembling that car. He did absolutely a phenomenal job on that. Oh yeah. By the way, you and Will did a pretty good job detailing this little jewel right here. Turned out pretty That's nice. Just, okay, I have several questions to talk about Cruise with Creek. Number one, why the constant drinking at these shows? What are you talking about? I'm talking about, about that every single time I saw you or Will, you had a drink in your hand. You oh, started out not trying to hide it. Then Nobody's that dehydrated. You get loud when you get drunk. Why do you hate that so much? Well, because you shouldn't be drunk out in public like, like that. It's fine. You ever duke yourself out in no, public? Dad. It's yeah. a funny story. So uh, my friend Jeff, he had been drinking all night. It was the next day, the next morning, he was walking by Fred and he ripped one apart. That's, and he actually duked his pants. That's and disgusting. And Fred Dad. passed out. That's, yeah, he got caught in the jet wash. Oh. I've never seen a grown man pass out from a, a fart, but I guess it can be toxic. Yeah, Royals told me a lot about yours. Mine are a lot more like an air freshener, sir. Huh? 